The Causes, the Consequences, and the Catastrophe of World War I. We are at the 100th anniversary of the ending of the First World War. Mark that on the 11th of the 11th just past. And at this, the last four years, we've been involved in a whole series of Great War centenaries. The poppy is one reminder, remembering those who've fallen. Candle at night. On the evening of the 11th, 11th, this last Sunday, I had the lights out, candle, uh, marking with my father's helmet uh, from the Second World War. And we've got a call every day at 12 noon to remember the fallen. In fact, it's a call to prayer, the noonday gun in Cape Town. You can go downtown, you can actually see a We Will Remember Them, two minutes of silence and remembrance, noonday gun. Uh, that's how it was instituted in 1918 here by Sir Harry Hands on the uh, initiative also of uh, Sir Percy Fitzpatrick, the author of Jock of the Bushveld. So we've also been remembering Rhodesia, declared its independence on 11th of November, and these are some of the kind of poppies, wreaths, remembering those who fought in the war in Rhodesia. But tonight we're wanting to deal with the causes, the consequences, and the catastrophe of World War I. The greatest conflict in the history of mankind, the most devastating. One where so many new technologies were brought in. One of my early mentors in understanding the First World War was A.J.P. Taylor. He is quite a great authority, and I was reading his books when I was still in junior school. And uh, I must say, A.J.P. Taylor opened my eyes to a whole lot of things on the First World War. In the First World War, you had trench warfare, you had machine guns, you had gas, you had aircraft, submarines, tanks, flamethrowers, no end of technology being innovated. And yet, the tactics being used were generally 19th century tactics from people who'd learned studying the Battle of Waterloo and the Battle of Gettysburg, and they were using 19th century tactics with 20th century weapons, which accounts for the colossal losses of life. This trench warfare was absolutely disastrous. At the going down the sun in the morning, we will remember them. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more. So Revelation 20 is make it clear that the nations are being deceived. The first casualty in war is truth. My history teacher in Rhodesia, Mr. Rhys Davies, who is also a member of Parliament, reminded us, beware the victor's version. Wartime propaganda morphs into peacetime textbooks, and all too often you've got a ministry of propaganda during war to lie, but you don't have a ministry of truth to unravel all the lies told during the war, after the war, and so that tends to, those wartime propagandas often last for decades and centuries later in this case. God is truth. God's word is truth. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And war broke out in heaven, and the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So Revelation 12, 7 makes it clear that Satan deceives the whole world. Satan is deceiving nations. We are being subjected to the greatest flood of misinformation and disinformation in the history of mankind. I could not imagine when my history teacher warned me in my first history lesson in high school, but where the victor's version, just how deceived I had been and how many lies I took for granted. Today's most effective propaganda machine is the television. And we have got generations of people who have been now taught to accept things that they would never have accepted before. A lie does not become truth, wrong does not become right, and evil does not become good just because it's accepted by majority and promoted ad nauseum 24 hours a day by Hollywood. There is no such thing as a harmless lie. All lies bring bondage. All lies, distortions of history, distortions in the media, myths, legends, exaggerations in history textbooks, they all have serious consequences. For example, the lie that all white people are racists and that the Boers stole the land. And that's justifying atrocities, farm murders, tortures, and all kinds of insane 
economic suicide in this country right now. There's no such thing as a harmless lie. Just saying, well, I don't want to hurt someone's feelings, so I'll keep quiet. But while you're keeping quiet, the lie is doing its damage, and it'll come to hurt everyone. Let me start with a tale of two conferences. I had the privilege of participating in Lausanne Conference 3, or Cape Town 2010, the largest missions conference ever held. And I couldn't help but notice it was exactly 100 years after the world's first missions conference, Edinburgh 1910. Now, nobody at Cape Town 2010 mentioned Edinburgh. There was no reference to it. But it's hard to believe it was just a sheer coincidence that we had this largest world missions conference in history held on the 100th anniversary of the first world missions conference. I mean, does that sort of thing happen by accident? Uh, well, certainly not in God's eyes. So here at Cape Town International Conference Center, we had 4,200 participants, and they came together from 197 countries. I could not help but notice exactly 200 years after William Carey had proposed a World Missions Conference. So William Carey, the father of modern missions, had proposed back in 1810, we need a World Missions Conference. And it took 100 years for the first World Missions Conference to be held. He also suggested... He recommended the best place for World Missions Conference would be Cape Town. Now, he'd only been in Cape Town once. But, in fact, he was so ahead of his time, it took 200 years for that to happen. But, a 100 years later, Edinburgh 1910. At the world's first missions conference held in Edinburgh 1910, delegates were anticipating the completion of the Great Commission within their generation. The consensus at Edinburgh 1910 was that every nation would be thoroughly evangelized and discipled and all false religions like Islam and Buddhism would be extinct by 1960, which was the year I was born. And I think we've all noticed the world's not thoroughly evangelized yet, and these false religions are not extinct yet. Were they unreasonable? No, actually. When I was at Cape Town 2010, I was horrified to find that we'd gone backwards. Because as I compared Edinburgh 1910 with Cape Town 2010, it was shocking. We were dealing with a resurgence of widow burning in India, which had been extinct in 1910. A resurgence of slavery. Do you know we've got more people enslaved today than there were when William Wilberforce succeeded in abolishing slavery over 200 years ago? Do you know they are going back to every kind of evil which had been made extinct? And we're also talking about diseases, a whole range of things which had been eradicated by 1910 are coming back in a flood in 2010. And this, yes, we might be able to put on some spectacular, colorful shows, but the fact is that Cape Town 2010 shouldn't have been a celebration, it should have been mourning, because actually the church had gone backwards so badly. In fact, you think in 1910, missionaries were allowed all over China, but we didn't have one single delegate from Red China at Luzon 1, Luzon 2, or Luzon 3. All 330 Chinese delegates who were going to come to Luzon 3 in Cape Town were missing. They were all arrested and prevented from leaving the country. All of them, everyone, not one got away. And in fact, it was even more incredible than that. Do you know, the first day of Cape Town 2010, now we had already 4,200 there. It should have been 4,500, but the 330 from China didn't make it. We should have also had a 100,000 others from another 100 countries join us by live feed with interactive ability, which was going to be part of, um, they had regional conferences organized for people who didn't make it to Cape Town who were going to participate. The entire system crashed. And then it was discovered we were being subjected to the first experience of Red China's ability to do cyber war. Millions of hostile hits took down the entire telecommunication system of the uh, Cape Town International Conference Center. Millions of hostile hits. They said, all originating from Red China. Red China shut down the international aspect of the World Trade Center. To think that they thought a World Missions Conference worthwhile to show to the world their abilities in cyber war, and also for them to show to the world that they're not a free country that they would have stopped every single represent, not one Chinese represent able to make it to the conference, at least not for mainland China. Some came from Taiwan, but that's nationalist free China. Operation World was also launched there, and we had a hand in it, and I've been 
uh, since 1986, one of the researchers that Patrick Johnson and now Jason Mendrick has made use of in succeeding Operation World. And Operation World has in many cases documented great strides for the gospel, but it's also documenting uh, a lot of problems, such as the fact that in the Middle East, we've gone from 15 million Christians in the Middle East in the year 2000, down to 12 million by then. We're down to less than 10 million Christians in the Middle East right now. Christians are fleeing because of the Arab Spring and the war on terror and the liberation of Iraq and all these other insane things in the war in Syria. Christians have suffered from Western policies in the Middle East to such an extent that the Middle East is actually going backwards. And bear in mind, the Middle East is where the gospel began. That's where Damascus, Jerusalem is. Uh, in fact, the seven churches in the book of Revelation are all in what today is Turkey, which is now the least evangelized people group in the world, the most unreached people group in the world, is over the area which used to be so strongly Christian. It's the seven churches in Revelation. So in 1900, you can see the darker the year, the red, the less the number of evangelicals. The brighter the yellow, the higher the percentage of evangelicals in that country. And so in 1910, 1900, you can see how the world was getting evangelized. And then you can see how William Carey had the vision of a World Missions Conference. I've documented the Great Essential Missions book, Adnan Judson, David Livingston, great missionaries, Mary Slessor, how they went out and they transformed the world. They won whole nations to Christ. The cricket superstar of his age, C.T. Studd, he wasn't, you know, it's interesting, back in the 1800s, a great Christian in sports didn't show his great Christianity by praying on the pitch, but by leaving the pitch and going into missions. You know, today, if the guy prays on the pitch, you wow, this is just outstanding. Whereas back then, he was the top cricketer of the top country in the world, and he threw it all away, and he gave away everything, and he gave his life to missions in China, India, and the Congo. Very interesting when you compare that, and you think of how Bishop Samuel Ajay Crowther of Nigeria, rescued from slavery in the mid-Atlantic at age 13 by the Royal Navy and raised to become the first African bishop of the Church of England, translated not only the Bible but prayer book into his language, uh, the Yoruba language, and went back to Nigeria. And today there are 18 times more Anglican Christians in Nigeria than there are in the whole of the British Isles and North America combined. The 19th century was the greatest century of missionary advance. It was a century of astounding inventions. In fact, bluntly speaking, virtually all the great inventions that we can think of took place in the 19th century. 20th century has just been refining what they basically pioneered in the 19th century, including everything from typewriters, Geiger counters, um, through to gramophones, uh, whether you're talking about cameras, the whole lot of movies, trains. At the beginning of the 19th century, in 1801, you couldn't travel faster than a horse could gallop. And by the end, wow, sky's the limit. Massive, the biggest moving human-made objects in the world, these ocean liners. Many countries in Europe experienced dramatic spiritual revivals. Christian missionaries won whole tribes and nations to Christ in the remotest regions of the globe. David Livingston set captives free. Mary Slessor ended widow burning. Unreal what they achieved. And all over Africa you can see appreciation for the impact of the gospel at that time. Christianity was making tremendous strides. But 1914 shattered Europe. An entire generation of young men died in brutal trench warfare. No other war changed the map of Europe so drastically. Whole countries came about that had not existed before. Three great European empires were destroyed by the First World War. The German Empire, which had protected Europe from the Huns and the Russians and the Eastern people for centuries. Germany, in fact, was multiple kingdoms, which was united under Prussia in what was called the German Empire. This is the main headquarters castle of the Hohenzollerns of, of Kaiser Wilhelm II. And all throughout Germany, you could see centuries of Christian culture 
that had produced the Reformation and so much more. German Empire gone. They had Gott mit uns, God with us, on their belt buckles. The Russian Empire, the largest Christian empire on earth, massive, 50,000 congregations across the country. The Russian Empire had not only subdued Islam, but had evangelized and taken the gospel all the way across to the Pacific Ocean, the whole of Northern Asia. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which for centuries had protected Europe from the Turks, They'd held the line to protect Europe from the threat of Turkish invasion for centuries, even Vienna itself being besieged twice. 1914 marked the end of the greatest century of Christian advance, the greatest century of missions, and the beginning of what proved to be the worst century of persecution. More Christians have been martyred for their faith in the 20th century than all other 19th centuries combined. The consequences of the First World War continues to have far-reaching repercussions to this present day. You just think how they entered the war with literally millions on cavalry. Soon you've got horrific pictures like this gas masks on a cavalry officer. And then the aircraft coming overhead, the trenches, the barbed wire making cavalry charges absolutely impossible. And more and more mud. This is the largest man-made hole outside of the big hole, Kimberley, one explosion. They brought in Welsh miners who dug and dug and dug for months and put millions of pounds of TNT underneath a German ridge controlled underneath. And when they exploded, they vaporized something like 10,000 people and created this massive hole, which now is a lake. You could hear that explosion in England. Not that they gained the area because it was such a mess they couldn't get in and take it anyway. Russia mobilized 12 million soldiers. Germany mobilized 11 million. France mobilized 8.4 million. And Great Britain mobilized 8.9 million, of which a quarter of a million were underage boys serving in the British Army, including one found to be 12 years old. One boy was 14 years old when he joined and 15 years old when he died, and I've been at his grave and I showed that picture last week. And of course, the Australians, New Zealanders, the Indians, not to mention South Africans and Rhodesians, average life expectancy in the trenches was about six weeks. Italy mobilized 5.6 million, Austria 7.8 million, and the United States, even though they came in only in the last year of the war, mobilized 4.3 million people. Of the 60 million European soldiers who were mobilized, and that's not counting what the Ottoman Turks were mobilizing or what was mobilized from India or Japan, just talking about the Europeans, 60 million European soldiers who were mobilized from 1914 to 1918, over 9 million were killed. I've seen some statistics up to 11 million. I think that's by counting in the people from outside Europe. 9 million others were permanently disabled, crippled. Another 15 million were seriously injured. That means more than half of all those mobilized became casualties. Contemporaries called it the Great War. They didn't call it the First World War. They called it the Great War. Only after the Second World War did they start to speak about the First World War. It was called the Great War up until 1939 because it was literally greater than any war waged before it. In numbers of soldiers involved, in numbers of casualties, in terms of catastrophic consequences, it was the most catastrophic event in the history of European civilization. Absolutely disastrous. In 1914, Christian nations ruled virtually the whole world. Christian civilization, or Christendom as they called Europe, dominated the globe. With the exception of China, which was very weak, Japan, which was modernizing and, and allied to Britain, and the Ottoman Empire, which was crumbling, the rest of the globe was dominated by Christian powers either Protestant, in the case of the superpowers, Great Britain, who controlled even India, a large part of Africa, and Germany and the United States. These were the Protestant countries. These were the greatest economic, political, military powers in the world. If those three had joined together, nothing could have stopped them. Roman Catholic, in the case of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or the French Empire, Italy, Spain, Portugal, or Orthodox, in the case of the Russian Empire. But Russian Orthodox, 
German and American, British, Protestants, Catholics ruled the world, basically. And you can see there's not a non-Christian power in all of Europe, with the exception of Turkey, who had now been pushed out of Europe to just this little toehold around Constantinople, which now is called Istanbul. But the rest was Christian. Following the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 and the conclusion of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, the Congress of Vienna, 1815, ushered in a century of comparative peace. For 99 years, Europe, especially Central and Eastern Europe, was Western Europe was basically at peace. It's extraordinary, considering the Versailles Treaties guaranteed non-stop war for the last century. Some people, being quite uncharitable, said, well, the reason why Congress of Vienna was so successful was there's no American representative there. Um, Woodrow Wilson was a catastrophe, and his ideas were a disaster, as we've suffered ever since. But maybe that's not being fair. But at the Congress of Vienna, Napoleon's foreign minister, Talleyrand, was sitting at the table helping to work out the map, whereas Germany and Austria and Hungary were not allowed to be at the table at Versailles to discuss the future of Europe. And so what they decided in 1814, in 1815 in the Congress of Vienna, created a stability for 99 years. Quite extraordinary. The 19th century was also a century of astounding increases in population growth, unprecedented increases in productivity and standards of living, agriculturally, industrially, in every way. For example, the English set up this crystal palace. By the way, if that looks familiar to you, it's because uh, the architects of the Victorian Alfred in um, the waterfront uh, specifically uh, modeled it on the Crystal Cathedral, which is part of the first great exhibition, where people from all over the world came to um, basically demonstrate their wares and new technologies and so on. You can see from the fashions, it was a time of prosperity. It was a time of peace, where people could specialize on fashions. And as it said, if one generation studies warfare, the next generation can study commerce and engineering. And in the third generation, the grandchildren can then study arts and uh, music and, and uh, fashion and, and be able to, to beautify the world. If you're only fighting for survival, you don't have the ability to do that. And so the 19th century was such a century of peace and prosperity and productivity that you could see fashion and the arts reaching high level. The 19th century had been a century of incredible achievements, growth and expansion. I mean, imagine you start off where you cannot send a message faster than a horse can travel. And at the end, you've got telegraphs, <laughs> you've got aircraft, you've got steam engines, you've got uh, ocean liners. By 1914, all the inhabited world had been penetrated and for the most part mastered by people who had traditionally been known as Christian. We're not saying each one of them had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, of course not, but we're saying they came from a Christian culture, a Christian worldview. They had a, a basically Christian ethos. At the beginning of the First World War, 64% of Europeans were in church every Sunday. Today, it's more like 4%. There was great promise. Christianity came to the beginning of the 20th century on a rising and apparently unstoppable tide. I mean, what could stop Christianity? Christianity was gaining spectacular momentum. Islam was withering away. Hinduism was withering away. All the pagan religions were withering away. Christianity was ascendant. Missionaries from Europe were evangelizing and discipling virtually every tribe and nation. The Maoris were coming to Christ in New Zealand. The Protestant faith had far outstripped the Catholic and Orthodox branches with leaders like Charles Spurgeon or General William Booth. The missionary activity, vitality initiative of the Protestants were leaving the Orthodox and the Catholics in the dust. From being confined to almost exclusively northwestern Europe, the British Isles in a narrow strip on the eastern seaboard North America, with a small outpost at the Cape of Good Hope, the Protestant faith in the 19th century became a truly international faith. The Protestants outstripped everybody. Nobody had ever seen such growth in numbers or geographically or in any way as what you saw in the greatest century of missions of the 19th century. It was also the dominant faith of the most productive, powerful, prosperous nations in both northern and southern hemispheres. Germany, Netherlands, Scandinavia, Great Britain, Canada, United States, and the southern hemisphere, South Africa, 
Rhodesia, New Zealand, Australia, the Protestant nations led the world in everything. Amidst irrepressible optimism, many were openly speaking of the beginning of the biblical millennium on earth. Now, just to give a feel of the history of religions, this isn't totally accurate, but just to give a bit of a feel, they show here a quick rough through a few minutes, okay, birth of Krishna and therefore the birth of Hinduism. Of course, Hinduism is multiple religions, actually hundreds of variations. Birth of Abraham. Now, they say, beginning of Judaism, that's nonsense. It was the Hebrew or Israel religion. Judaism actually dates from the Talmud and mostly from the Babylonian captivity. You don't read of the word Jew before uh, 600 BC. So, uh, to call Judaism is false. But anyway, nevertheless, we get to point Buddhism now. Forget the death of Jesus. It's the resurrection of Jesus that started. So I don't agree with the way they've put it entirely. But it still gives you a bit of a short view. But the key thing here we're trying to show is you've seen the growth of Hinduism over thousands of years, Buddhism for thousands of years. Now what you've got to see is the growth of Islam. Islam here, of course, by the sword, takes a huge amount of territory, including from North Africa and the Middle East, which was thoroughly Christian. The early church fathers came almost exclusively from North Africa. But now look what happens. In the Middle Ages, you can see Islam grows, but now the Crusades puts Islam more in a retreat, and you can see Christianity liberates Spain. And at this point, you can see, well, Islam and Buddhism control most of the world. But what happens at the Reformation? And now this is on 19th century. Beginning of 19th century, you suddenly see spectacular growth of Christianity. That just gives you a bit of a feel for the growth potentially so a quick run through the world's never seen anything like this that a religion can go to all the continents of the world in one century so spectacularly so that's just a, a quick overview let me get out of this so at the first world missions conference in edinburgh 1910 Delegates were anticipating the completion of Christ's Great Commission within their generation. Had present trends continued? That was a very realistic scenario. Nothing could have stopped the onward march, the positive advance of Christianity worldwide, except that Christians were persuaded to kill one another so enthusiastically and so efficiently. No one in 1910 could have anticipated the wholesale abandonment of entire nations like the Russian Empire to communism, or whole countries to false religions like Islam, or heathenism, having a resurgence even the British Isles. No one could have predicted in 1910 that the church would retreat from victory to such an extent that some would even be questioning the existence of the devil or hell. Or reinterpreting marriage to include what God in the Bible describes as a perversion and an abomination. And now some denominations, abominations, even thinking, can you have perverts as ministers? The Christian era of bold missionary expansion came to an abrupt end as the guns of August 1914 erupted. The great Christian nations, which had been the heartland of Christendom, the source of most of the world's missionaries, devastated each other's economies, annihilated millions of one another's young men in what has to be recognized as the most tragic, senseless conflict in all of history. Before the First World War, Europe had never been more powerful. No continent had ever been so powerful or more self-confident. There was not the slightest hint of any possible challenge to its leadership of the civilized world. I mean, America was really a backwater. Russia was something of a backwater. Europe ran the show. And it's extraordinary how the First World War destroyed everything that Europe had. 1914 marks a far more drastic turning point than 1815, which is Battle of Waterloo, or 1648, Peace of Westphalia, which ended the Thirty Years' War, or any other watershed events in its earlier history. As the great nations of Europe mobilized for war against themselves, you could call it an autogenocide or Europe's civil war. Yes, these were Christians killing one another. It was said at that time, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. The man who said that was the British foreign minister who actually was an architect of the war, who'd actually organized the secret treaty that Britain was allied to France and Russia, which nobody seemed to know about. In fact, most of the British cabinet didn't even know about it. 
Uh, so he was actually a key architect of this war anyway, and uh, nevertheless he made a prophetic statement, even though he is personally responsible for it. Yet even as that was said, it could not have been anticipated how much destruction and dislocation of Christian civilization would come from this disastrous conflict. When lamps of political wisdom and spiritual truth or intellectual or artistic progress or moral foundations and economic growth were rekindled, they shone far less brightly in the ancient centers of European civilization than they had done for centuries before. Patrick Buchanan, this man here who's advisor and speechwriter for Ronald Reagan, wrote Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War, How Britain Lost Its Empire and the West Lost the World, one of the most insightful, important books I've read on the First and Second World War. He treats it as one war. He calls it a 30 years war, because in a real sense, First and Second World War are one war, and I think that's a very good insight. And he shows how it's totally unnecessary and shows how there's only one individual who was involved in the organizing and declaring of the First World War and the Second World War, Winston Churchill. He was the warmonger par excellence, one of the only two cabinet ministers in the British cabinet who wanted war. All the others, including the British Prime Minister, didn't. He was the first Lord the Admiralty and he pushed for it and he engineered Britain into both the First and the Second World War. And uh, interesting that when Churchill entered politics, 1910, Britain was unassailable, the greatest power in every way, economically, Navy-wise, and so on. And by the time he ended his involvement in politics, by about 1955, Britain was a second rate, if not a third rate, has been uh, being colonized by uh, West Indians and so on, and Muslims. And he, more than anyone, was responsible for it. In fact, as has been shown recently, Winston Churchill was a homosexual pervert who was involved in hideous kinds of uh, activities. And uh, I mean, you can even sort of get some of the idea in some, this picture. But uh, that's another story. So who gets a responsibility for the Great War? Well, because you had monarchs all over Europe, they tend to get the blame, even though in none of the cases were the absolute monarchs. In every case, the monarchs tried to avoid the war. And in every case, it was the parliaments who actually pushed ahead and the newspaper editors and the mobs in the streets that were pushing for the war. The leaders who get the blame, the kings, were actually not responsible. London's Daily Telegraph recently, in an article responding to Boris Johnson, who declared that Germany was responsible for the Great War, the First World War, responded, Boris Johnson, not a historian, is to be condemned for ignoring a century of scholarship, showing that Germany was not responsible for the Great War. It really is difficult to believe that this wartime allied propaganda is still being repeated a century on as gospel, and so cementing into the uneducated minds a travesty of truth. The German diplomatic service, more than any others, were desperately trying to avoid a war until the last minute. In fact, Germany was the last country to mobilize, which was universally accepted as a declaration of war upon your neighbors. Even Belgium mobilized before Germany. Now, mobilization was irreversible. Once you start to mobilize, you couldn't stop it. It was railway triumph tables. You had to move maximum amount of troops. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, actually millions of people ultimately, to the battlefronts on a very strict time scale. And the way of thinking of the military in 1914 was the, the country that mobilized the fastest and gets the most amount of men into position earliest are the ones who win. And so everything was train timetables. And the idea was, it's like if you're thinking of uh, two cowboys facing one another, uh, the first to draw might be the one who walks away alive. You know, it's, it's that kind of attitude. And so every country around Germany had mobilized. Russia, France, Belgium, against Germany, before Germany began to mobilize. How does Germany get the blame? I'm still quoting, though, from the uh, British editorial. We should be under no illusions that the Serbs from Serbia bear the principal responsibility for starting the ball rolling by the organized murder of the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary and his wife, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and Sophie. Uh, so that's interesting observation from a British editorial, which I wouldn't have expected such a responsible, insightful reply from. But in Britain, the newspapers tend to be more in-depth, whereas the TV tends to be as shallow as hell. Um, but AJP Taylor, Richard Milton... Patrick Buchanan certainly back up this. As uh, Patrick Buchanan says, no 
monarch did more to avert the war. In fact, no other monarch did anything to try and avert the war other than Kaiser Wilhelm II. Kaiser Wilhelm II gets blamed for the war, and he's the only one who's actually doing anything to try and stop it. And so it's a total travesty of truth to blame uh, the people who actually were the least responsible of all. <laughs> As uh, this book, The Hidden History, <laughs> The Secret Origins of the First World War, shows, a lot of things you're still not allowed to say because so much has been censored. Stephen Mitford Goodson, good friend of our mission, who's spoken on numerous occasions at the Reformation Society in his book, A History of Central Banking and Enslavement of Mankind, makes a statement that all the wars of the 20th century have been bankers' wars. He blames it on the Rothschilds and the other bankers under them, uh, that they are the ones who basically start all these wars. And he goes back to even French Napoleonic Wars. The sinister bankers, or I call them the banksters, who pulled the strings behind the scenes and engineered the autogenocide of Europe, were also the ones who owned many of the companies, who made the machine guns, and the bullets, and the bombs. Lots of bombs. Lots of bombs. Of all sizes and shapes. You can't imagine how many bombs these people produced. And by the way, where's this ammunition factory? Coventry. You might wonder why Coventry was bombed in the Second World War by the Luftwaffe. Well, it happened to have the biggest munitions plant in all of Britain, and it's owned by the Rothschilds. Gas bombs in Coventry being produced for the First World War. These are, this is a picture I took up in Ypres. These are bombs that, what happens is farmers plying their fields around Belgium keep finding bombs. You don't call the bomb disposal or the army. It's so common. They put the bombs by the side of the road, and uh, every day an engineer drives around and just picks them up on the side of the road. I would drive Boston. This was at one farm. They had a whole pile of these things, waiting for somebody to move them. Uh, those are unexploded bombs. You'll notice a huge amount of bombs. In fact, anything from 10 to 20 percent of the shells fail to explode in the First World War. Almost 20 percent failure rate. And so they're still digging up unexploded bombs to this day. Obviously, work ethic wasn't always that good. But who's complaining? So the Rothschilds were not only running the banks, they were also running the artillery production. That's also a Rothschild producing place. That produced the artillery and the trains and the massive cannons and the tanks which destroyed the cream of Europe. By the way, you might be interested to know that in the First World War, Great Britain manufactured 5,000 tanks. And Germany manufactured 10. Uh, Germany put that right the Second World War. They realized they should have put more effort to tanks. But just interesting, and all these tanks were, of course, made by Rothschilds. Of course, most of them didn't manage to drive more than about two miles before getting destroyed. But nevertheless, it sucked up a lot of money and a lot of debt while doing so. To give you an idea, at the beginning of the war, 1914, uh, again, from an AJP Taylor book, uh, the columns indicate the number of men under arms in thousands. So France had 794,000 men under arms, Germany 834,000 men under arms, Russia 1.3 million men under arms. This is at the beginning of the war. Britain seems to have very few, but bear in mind, Britain never had a large army. They have a huge navy. But notice, Britain's, the circle indicates the peacetime budgets. Britain spending much more money on its armaments, 395 million, than Germany, 340 million. Why? Because Navy equipment costs more than Army equipment. And so you can see how Germany's spending about the same amount of money as France, but France is allied with Britain and Russia, who's not just outnumbering Germany in every way, but outspending them too. Uh, whereas Austria didn't have that much, 170 million. Uh, where's that a huge amount of territory in 470, 497,000 men under arms. So plainly you can see the picture that Germany was apparently militaristic or outnumbered. They weren't outnumbering, outspending anyone. In fact, um, France, which had a much smaller population, had an army almost the same size. But of course, France only had to worry about one frontier. Germany would have to worry about two, actually three, because they'd have to go and help Austria against Italy. During one battle in Flanders, Belgium, five million artillery shells were fired by the British artillery in a three-day period. Five million! 
artillery shells along a 10-mile front on three days. And to give you a bit of a feel of this, just look at the shells, the empty cartridges accumulated behind these cans. I mean, this is why people who worked in artillery like my dad had hearing problems. Yeah. Pardon? What was that? Uh, mountains and mountains. Just think what could have been done if this had been used for something constructive. An average of five tons of high explosives were placed in every square meter, turning the ground into mud. I mean, Belgium's got a low water table. This mud swallowed up entire units, cavalry and artillery of the British and Canadian forces when they were ordered into the quagmire of this Passchendaele. Many just disappeared, and they're still digging them up. I mean, disappeared, gone. Horse bridled under artillery, carriage, people. They marched them in. They asked the general to consolidate, and he responded back with a famous telegram saying, you cannot consolidate porridge. And they, they, they first bombed the hell out of the place, then they ordered their men to march in, and most of them drowned. They lost tens of thousands of men to the mud created by the artillery. This is, Passchendaele is one word that conjures up to Canadians, for example, because most of their men in that battle died from a friendly fire from British artillery or from the mud. And what it did to great forests. There are numerous studies that have shown the role of Freemason banksters and politicians like Lord Nathan Rothschild, whose goal was stated to bring down Christian civilization. And earlier Nathan Rothschild had said, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire, and I control the British money supply. Now this man was in charge of the Bank of England, and he also was the first Jew to be allowed to be a lord in the British Parliament. You had to be a Protestant to be uh, in the British Parliament. And at some point they allowed Catholics in. And then uh, back sometime 19th century, they allowed one exception to a Jew that he didn't even have to hold to the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. And that was Lord Nathan Rothschild, who just happened to control the Bank of England. Not that we're suggesting there's any corruption or people setting their principles, but... Uh, that's how that started. War is the greatest debt creator known to man. Although I think they, the big farmers catching up. The cost of the war for Britain alone was five million pounds every single day. The total cost of the First World War for Britain was 186 billion in US dollars. Now, those who control the debt control everything. This is just a bit more of the Rothschild armory in Coventry. Just, I mean, I remember being brought up with the idea of like Coventry uh, was for no reason at all bombed by the Luftwaffe. And then you discover, well, it happened to be the biggest munitions factory center uh, around outside of Manchester. And, uh, well, why wouldn't you bomb a munitions factory in the middle of a war? Now, you notice the Freemason symbol. You, if you've paid attention to the United States... Washington, D.C., Capitol, outbinder. The Pennsylvania Avenue and so on comes like this. And the way they've got the Washington Monument in the middle, and the way they've positioned everything between the White House and the Congress, it's all in a Freemasonry symbol. German Democratic Republic, DDR, also had the Freemason symbol openly on their flag, East Germany. Freemasons have this kind of ring. We can see the Freemasonry symbol. And, of course, they claim to have all kinds of rights, the York right, the Scottish right, and and various allied organizations of the Freemasons. And uh, in South Africa, I believe the Brudabont was basically a Afrikaans version of the Freemasons, and many of them overlapped as well. Notice, if you go into the American money supply, you can see the occultic hexagram. Notice there are six lines, there are six triangles, and there are six points. You've got 666 right there on a dollar note, with the all-seeing eye smack in the middle of it. And it says a new world order. That's on the dollar bill. A reptilian eye of Osiris or Nimrod, cult of three horned god, and all that sort of thing. This is another one of the Rothschilds. Uh, here's Joseph Rothschild and his children. Now his children went were sent off to ta start a bank in every single place in Europe. And so, uh, and this is my Rothschild who ended the First World War. Uh, so here you can see, for example, so 
Nathan Rothschild ran the Bank of London, Bank of England. Amschel, the Bank of Frankfurt. Solomon, Bank of Vienna. Cole, the Bank of Naples, Italy. Uh, and uh, James, the Bank in Paris. And so you can see how they were basically controlling Holland. There was one country they did not control the Bank of, Russia, under the Tsar. And so the biggest goal of the banksters, of the communists in the First World War, was destroy the Tsar. And only once they destroyed the Tsar did they change to, now let's destroy the Kaiser, second main target. Because, in fact, they had had a heyday in Germany because they controlled all the banks there. But the first thing was to get rid of Russia as the one place without a Rothschild bank. Here you can actually see some of the family tree of key Rothschilds. And at the moment, um, who's the key person running the whole show? I think, uh, yes, you can see right now, we've got Nathan Rothschild. And this, this chap is today the senior of the Rothschild family. By the way, the Rothschilds are continually encouraged to marry within their family to keep the money within the family. Nothing could have stopped the positive onward march of Christianity worldwide except that Christians were persuaded to kill one another so enthusiastically and so efficiently. So the Butcher's Bill. Devastating results. The London Times of 24th of July 1916, during the Battle of the Somme, listed 608 British officers killed, 5,500 other ranks. That's just one day's casualty list. One day. And the battle went on for four months. And they got four miles in four months, after losing 650,000 men, and then they lost it all. 8% of Great Britain's total population were casualties. 9% of Germany's total population were killed or wounded. 11% of France's entire population were casualties of the war. Now, that's just not, we're not talking about the men. We're not talking about the soldiers. We mean of the total population, men, women, children, from pensioners down to babies just born. This is a colossal amount of your population to lose. The British Empire lost 908,000 people. Russia lost 1.7 million at least. But that's nothing compared to what was coming from the liberators. France lost 1.3 million. Germany lost 1.7 million soldiers killed. If you added the crippled, it went over 2 million. That's a lot of war widows and orphans left behind to be kicked out of their homes by bankers. Uh, here's some of the casualties in, this, in the war, and you can see from Russia, Britain, all the way down to Montenegro, Portugal, and total mobilized, total numbers killed, total numbers wounded, prisoners missing, total casualties, percentage of the mobilized. You can see over 52% of those mobilized were casualties, either killed or wounded or captured. And uh, so that's of the Allies, and then you can see of the Central Powers on this side. How many were killed, lost, and so on? It's just absolutely staggering, mind-boggling. This did not include the many hundreds of thousands of civilians who died of starvation, especially in Germany and Austria, due to the Royal Navy hunger blockade. Diseases account for one-third of the deaths during the war. And if you think that's bad, another story for another day is that more people died from the Spanish flu, so-called, which has nothing to do with Spain, nothing to do with flu, it was actually an inoculation scam, which wiped out more people after the war in the so-called influenza epidemic in the year after the war than even died during the war. But that, that's for another day. And so this was the great disaster. Here's one Scottish regiment. Before the war, 1914, before they went in, after the war, all that was left of that unit after four years. And you know, I wonder how many of those are part of the original or because they would have gotten re um they wouldn't would have had more recruits sometime during the war, but that's the kind of devastation. At Men and Gate in Ypres, I have been there every day, they play last post and read out different names that died during the war, and it takes them all year to get through them. In a 10-mile radius around Ypres, there are 154 British and Empire war cemeteries. I saw on one mission about 64 Hammonds written on the walls. Counted over 80-odd on different times, going to six different war cemeteries, the biggest. And you only read names on the wall of those whose bodies were not recoverable because they were blown to peace by artillery. If they've 
had any kind of body that they could identify, they got a grave. The wars were for the ones... Remember, over 60% of the people who died in the war, in a great war, died from artillery. They've got these ghost soldiers set up to mark the 100th anniversary of the uh, ending of the war with the armistice. These are... Uh, an artist has put together these soldiers made of wire, basically, uh, to remind people of the missing generation. Then there's the animals. Most people aren't aware that there were many dogs who would take supplies, ammunition, medicine to people caught between the lines or messages. And so they were the war dogs and the horses. This is the most tragic. Millions of horses died in the First World War. Of course, they thought that the cavalry was going to have the great breakthrough. And there was huge amounts of cavalry waiting behind the lines. And there was no time that the cavalry ever had a chance to, to break through. It just didn't really happen. So there are many monuments to the cavalry and the horses. You can imagine the bond that the people would have with their animals. And so how absolutely terrible to see that animals died because of the wickedness and warfare of man. This is one horse memorial with the stirrups and horseshoes. Here's some American soldiers who formed a horse's head in memory of the tens of thousands of horses who died on the American side in the war. Here you can see Winston Churchill, one of the people who is the architect of the war, riding there near. One film that helps one understand some of what the horses went through is the film War Horse, which is surprisingly good. What's also striking is at the end of this brutal, brutal war, 1918, soldiers in the trenches stopped fighting to come out to help a horse that was caught in no man's land in the barbed wire and sharing wire cutters to get him out. And that just shows that there was still a hint of Christian Christianity and humanity there between the enemies. They might have been trying to kill one another, but there was this, this isn't right. How can this horse suffer because of us? And that they stopped and came out and set the horse free. Tragically, the South African Infantry Division at Delverwood had a springbok. Why they took a springbok up into that hellhole, I don't know. And this poor springbok did not survive. Of course, our whole South African infantry has always been known as the Springboks or the Bokops. And uh, they remembered also at the Delva Wood Memorial. And here, just one memorial to horses that died in the Anglo Boer War, which is in, in Port Elizabeth, and I've seen. The greatness of a nation consists no, not so much in the number of its people or the extent of its territory as an extent of its justice and its compassion, in this case, for animals. And so the purple poppy is there to remind us to remember the animals too. Even more devastating than the actual numbers of people and animals killed, crippled, or severely injured was the damage to the spiritual life of Europe. Europe went from being a majority church-attending population to a continent where most people did not go to church. Before the First World War, 64%. After the, second, after the First World War, 42% went to church every Sunday. End of the Second World War, 2% went down and sometimes 2% like Portugal, 4% in Britain, 5% in Germany. Continent wide around 4%. Here you can see three British soldiers helping a Frenchman out of a mud hole. This gives you a little bit of hope when you can see that even in the middle of this kind of brutal conflict, there was compassion for one's enemies. And here you can see uh, this British of soldier's been captured. You can see he's been dressed with a wound. And here's one of his because he's not wearing his webbing, so he's obviously the captain, uh, uh, the captive, and his captor's giving him a cigarette. Mm -hmm. um, tragically, pacifists or non, uh, non combatants like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, or Mennonites or Amish, were treated shamefully. They'd be put in stocks, called traitors, people would throw things at them, they'd be disgraced. This is just shocking. Even, well, in the Bible, you're told that. Before going to battle, you say, is anyone afraid, anyone who's been recently married, anyone who, you know, and you let them go. You don't force people to go to battle whose heart's not in it. You don't want someone next to you who's not totally committed. Anyway, to treat people who, for conscience reason or whatever their reason is, 
don't want to go to battle is just wrong. I, I think this is shameful. This isn't Britain. Um, and they did this in America too. In fact, they put Mennonites and Amish in prison. And they treated them like criminals for not being willing to go and fight. With so many men, millions of men mobilized for war, millions of women had to be mobilized to fill their places in the workplace, in the factories and on the farms. Building aircraft, typing, producing all kinds of weapons. More than a million women in Britain were mobilized in the workplaces previously performed by men. Those women who worked with TNT found their skin turned yellow through toxic jaundice. The mobilizing of millions of women into factories and fields to take the place of men conscripted into war transformed the entire social order and eroded the stability of an entire generation as a generation of children were deprived of the influence of both father and mother at home. And if the father died, which was high chance, they, were, they lost the father and they didn't see their mother much. So who's bringing up these children? Well, it explains why the 20s were so wild. Because those kids, they did, you know, the whole prohibition and all the different, uh, the flappers, and uh, in fact, was one of the most immoral generations of the 1920s. The secularization of Europe and the breakdown of moral standards coincided with a great resurgence of revolutionary fervor. Marxist communism filled the vacuum left by the collapse of the Russian Empire and by the emergence of many of the new countries in Eastern Europe in place of the Austrian Empire. Along with the spiritual decline of Europe came the decline of Western Europe on the total world scene. The 19th century had seen such staggering growth in numbers, such productivity, such military power, such wealth. You would have expected that Europe would have continued to dominate the globe for centuries to come. Why not? For over a thousand years, Europe had been Christendom, the heartland and stronghold of Christian civilization the fountainhead of world missionaries. The optimism which had prevailed throughout the 19th century, the greatest century of missions, gave way to profound pessimism after the First World War. Before the First World War, most Protestant Christians were post-millennial. They believed we were going to fulfill the Great Commission before the Lord returned. Afterwards, most became what they called pessimillennialists or premillennialists and panmillennialists and all that. The de-Christianization and secularization of Europe was not only unprecedented in its speed and scope, but would have been unthinkable before the First World War. What's this? Communists going through Berlin by the Brandenburg Gate, scattering Marxist bulletins in 1918. As the Kaiser was forced to abdicate, as the armistice was declared, communists tried to organize, and they did have communist revolutions in Germany, in Bavaria, in Hungary, and it could have been just like the Bolshevik Revolution. For over a thousand years, Europe had been Christendom, the heartland and stronghold of Christian civilization. The optimism which had prevailed during the 19th century now was profound pessimism after the First World War. The de-Christianization of Europe and its secularization was unprecedented. It would have been unthinkable before the First World War. In Europe, the traditional stronghold of the Christian faith, the proportion of those who called themselves Christians declined rapidly. And the percentage of those who regularly attended church services fell off even more drastically. I don't know if you can remember a time when nurses wore a red cross very prominently. I remember that in Rhodesia. Although it's a long time since I've seen a nurse wearing a red cross firmly on their uniform. While Protestants were rapidly increasing in Africa, North and South America and Asia, the numbers of Christians in Europe declined sharply. So what could have caused such a cataclysm? It's notable. Social Darwinism had become popular amongst the governments of Europe before 1914. This thinking emphasized the importance of armed struggle between nations as healthy and necessary for evolution and progress. That's what they were taught, teaching. This is social Darwinism. Charles Darwin can be seen as the grandfather of the First World War. The origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And so these days, <clears throat> most prefer to speak about the origin of species, but that's not the whole title. And you can see the evolution and devolution of species. There were also the entangling alliances, particularly the Entente Cordial between France and Russia in 1894, between Britain and France in 1904, between Britain and Russia in 1907. Although the ones between Britain and Russia and Britain and France were secret, not even the whole British cabinet knew about those. And that formed the Triple Entente. So the question is, why... Did Great Britain 
form an alliance with their traditional enemies, the French and the Russians, against the traditional allies, the Germans. I mean, remember, Germany and Britain were the best of friends. They'd never fought against one another before 1914. Here you can see from Patrick Johnson's um, history, uh, Future of Christian Church, people group clusters. Notice Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and the British Isles and Iceland, and the Scandinavian countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, are the same people group, the Germanic people. Germanic people, Anglo-Celtic, Germanic, and Scandinavian. So how did Germany and Britain end up on opposite sides? Unthinkable, never happened before. In the Seven Years' War, in the Napoleonic Wars, in the Thirty Years' War, Germany and Britain were always allies, always. In fact, German royal family and the British royal family were the same thing. How did a terrorist act in Sarajevo sever the special relationship between Britain and Germany that had endured for centuries. It's understandable that Austria was going to deal with a troublesome terrorist-sponsoring rogue state neighbor Serbia, who'd been encouraging and hosting revolutionaries and terrorists against Austria-Hungarian Empire. In fact, they had been sponsoring terrorist activities taking place all over Europe. However, as Austria presented an ultimatum to Serbia, which, by the way, even Britain at the time, even Winston Churchill said was imminently reasonable, what Austria's demanding of Serbia was completely reasonable. Even Russia thought it was a reasonable demands. The Russian Empire, though, mobilized against Austria because, well, yeah, Slavs stick together kind of idea. This led to Germany mobilizing in support of its Austrian ally against Russia. Okay, we can see where this is going. But then the French were allied to the Russian Empire and they were spoiling for a fight to reverse the humiliating military defeat they'd suffered at the hands of Germany in 1870 when Napoleon III, Emperor Napoleon III, had invaded Germany and tried to destroy them and got knocked for six so fast his head spun. And uh, that, that was the end of the Napoleonic dynasty in, in um, Europe, 1870. They wanted revenge. And the French were super keen for a fight against Germany. But strangely, King Edward VII had allied Britain to France and Russia, probably out of spite for his godly Protestant evangelical parents, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, both of whom were German. And Prince Albert and Queen Victoria spoke German to one another in Buckingham Palace and raised their children with German being the first language. But Prince Albert, who, by the way, was named, um, I should say, King Edward was called Albert. He, was, he, he would have been King Albert. But so much did he detest his hard-working, diligent, evangelical father that he took another name of Edward, but he then reversed the centuries-long policy of the royals and allied with France, the enemy of Britain, and Russia, the enemy of Britain. I mean, who were they fighting in the Napoleonic Wars and the Crimean War? And now, just because he hated his parents, he allied Britain. In fact, they said he signed the Entente while on a brothel crawl in Paris. So Britain ended up on the side of its traditional enemies, France and Russia, against its traditionally closest ally, Germany, with whom the royal family was completely and totally interrelated. Here you can see the people in Britain getting enthusiastic over the news. Most of the 60 million soldiers involved in the Great War would have been unable to explain what they were actually fighting about. If you asked them what you're fighting for, I think the average person might have said king and country, garden country. But I mean, why, how, in what way is this relevant? It would have had trouble explaining. That there were pawns in a diplomatic power game manipulated by unseen conspirators behind the scenes would have been the furthest thing from their minds. From the British point of view, involvement in the First World War is an even greater mystery. No British interests were at stake. Had Britain stayed out of the European conflict, it wouldn't have been a world war, it would have just been a European war, which would have lasted a very short time. So what would have happened had Britain stayed out of the conflict? I mean, bearing in mind, Britain covered a huge amount of territory around the globe. The moment they got into it, it was a world war. Well, first of all, if Britain had stayed out of the First World War, they would have kept the empire. Britain controlled one-fifth of the world's land surface, one-fifth of the world's population before 1914. They controlled all the key gateways, all the key strategic naval places. I mean, the Royal Navy controlled the seas totally, completely. The British Empire in 1914 was spectacular, unbeatable, you would have said. 
Secondly, Germany would have been able to defeat both Bro France and Russia in a matter of months. In fact, without the help of Britain, uh, France would have lost the war. Germany was winning in Belgium and France. They, were, they would have taken Paris. It was only the British army that stopped them uh, getting across the Marne, the, what they called the miracle of the Marne. But the thing is, Britain had a very professional army. And uh, it might have been small, but it was extremely professional. They'd been fighting wars nonstop all over the world uh, on the, in the empire. So they had a very experienced army. Whereas Germany hadn't had a war in, well, not in the 25 years that uh, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II had been uh, uh, the Kaiser. So, in fact, Germany's last war had been 1870. There would have been nobody alive in Germany that would have been involved in the army that had ever fought in a war before, whereas the British army was extremely experienced. Now, the German army was disciplined and well-trained. In fact, as an American intelligence officer pointed out, he, he did a, he could tell the war was coming. Uh, so, in 1914, a British mil uh, American military officer report back, the British army, the French army trains at 40 meters. Their rifle range is 40 meters. That's like a pistol range in my mind. The British army trains at 100 meters. The German army trains at 300 meters. The Swiss army trains at 400 meters. And just that information on musketry showed you France doesn't have a chance. The British are better. The Germans are better than both of them. But honestly, the Swiss could take everyone on. Because you're in range before they're in range. Because their musketry is so superior. Well, the German army did lick the Russians at Tannenberg and the French, and but for Britain and their naval blockade, uh, the war would have gone Germany's way very, very quickly. So new treaties would have been signed, some borders would have been adjusted, but no cataclysm collapse of empires would have occurred. The Tsar would still be Tsar, France would still be France. Not much would have changed, although Serbia might have ended up part of Austria, but that would be no loss. The death toll would have been a fraction of what it became if the war had just taken a couple of months. America wouldn't have been dragged into the war, of course, if Britain hadn't gotten the war. There would mean nothing to get America in the war. And, of course, South Africa. By the way, that was the South African flag in the First World War. The red dust, as they called it, with the Union Jack in the corner, and there you can see the Cape, the Orange Free State, Transvaal, and the Tel um, symbols in the Union symbol. So that was the South African flag during the First World War. The Rhodesians wouldn't have been mobilized in the war either. This is some Rhodesians marching off to war in shorts. Can you believe it? And uh, Europe would have remained the most powerful industrial, political, military force in the world. The Europe War, they wouldn't have called it the First World War. They would have been called the Great War. It would have been over shortly, and Europe would still be pretty strong. So if Britain had stayed out of it, it wouldn't have lasted that long. wouldn't have killed so many people. It wouldn't have involved us either. It wouldn't have involved anyone in Africa, actually. The constitutional monarchies in Central and Eastern Europe would have continued to reform. They would have endured. Some people say, oh, we needed the First World War to bring democracy to Germany, Austria, and Russia. Rubbish. It was the Duma, the Parliament of Russia, that, that forced the Tsar to abdicate. Well, oh, Russia had a Duma, a Parliament? Yes, they did. <laughs> so where's this business that there wasn't any... Um, democracies in these countries before the First World War. Germany had a parliament, Austria had a parliament, they all had parliaments, and it would have continued to reform. Britain didn't even have one man, one vote in 1914. For example, women didn't have the vote yet in Britain until 1920. So there would have been no power vacuum into which communism could have been born. There obviously would have been no Second World War either. All in all, the world would have been a far better and different place if Britain had set out that war and not taken the side of the Serbian terrorist. Charles Lindbergh and his father were the main outspoken opponents to American involvement in both the First and Second World War. Our bond with Europe is a bond of race and not of political ideology. It is European race we must preserve. Political progress will follow. Racial strength is vital. Politics is a luxury. If the white race is ever seriously threatened, it may then be time for us, meaning America, to take our part in its protection. To fight side by side with the English, French and Germans, but not with one another against the other for our mutual destruction. So he said, if America ever gets involved, it should be to fight with Europe against threats to Christian Europe. We don't want to go to war fighting against fellow Christians. 
Renus makes sense. He's of course hated for having said that because he and his father did not believe America should be involved in Europe's wars. America's most combat decorated veteran Marine, Major General Smedley Butler, stated at the beginning of the First World War, and he had been involved in Mexico, Philippines, all sorts of wars, Cuba and so on. He said there's only two things we should fight for. One is the defense of our homes, and the other is the Bill of Rights. War, for any other reason, is simply a racket. And he wrote the book, War is a Racket. He was heavily involved in speaking out against America, getting involved in the First World War and the Second. So why did Britain get involved in the First World War? The Liberals had been power in the House of Commons since 1906. The electoral support was withering away. Herbert Askew, the Prime Minister's government, was on the verge of collapse. It was clear that they went to war partly to keep the Conservative Party from ousting them in the imminent elections. Now, to those who ask, is it possible that any political leaders could be so small-minded as to jeopardize the lives of millions of people and the good of their nation merely to keep their petty political party in power? Recent history confirms that just such corrupt, small-minded pettiness continues to predominate amongst many who meant to be civil servants. Never before had so much of mankind been involved simultaneously in war. Never before had humankind massed such large armies or produced such weapons which worked wholesale destruction such a gigantic scale. The Protestant faith had originated in Saxony, Germany. It was the historic center of Lutheranism. From Germany, thousands of Protestant missionaries had gone out to many parts of the world. As documented by Patrick Johnson, The Future of the Global Church, he shows here <coughs> the top 20 countries are listed uh, here, countries which are largely Christian. And so you can see Germany was the third largest Christian country in the world after America and Russia in 1900. By 1950, Germany was the second largest Christian country, just in terms of numbers of Christians. By now, they're down to the ninth largest. Top evangelical countries in the world, Germany in 1900 was the third largest country of evangelicals in the world, under America and Britain. By 1960, evangelicals were down to the seventh largest in the world. And today, Germany is not even on the map in terms of evangelicals. Here you can see a map of Christianity versus Islam. The, here's the percent of the world's population, 20%, 40 up to 100%. Here's years from the 1st century to the 20th, 21st century. Yellow shows the size of Christians over the years. And you can see Islam brought a decrease in number of Christians and an end to the great growth of Christianity. But it started to plateau before Islam came up. I'd say Islam was a judgment on a backslidden church. But you can see during the Crusades, the number of Christians increased. But then due to the bubonic plague or the Black Death, it declined dramatically. One third of all the people in the world died. And then you can see how the Christian um, rise during the 19th century, the greatest century of missions, came to a skiddy halt and decline after the First World War. But we've been growing somewhat since, but that's more in Europe, uh, in Africa rather than Europe. Look at here at the top missionary sending countries in the world. In 1900, Germany was the third largest missionary sending country in the world. By 1960, they were down to the eighth largest. They maintain they're the eighth largest missionary sending country in the world to this day. So you can see where the missionaries are sent from. It was Germany who bore the brunt of World War I, fighting on the Western Front, Eastern Front, and even the Southern Front. It was Germany as crushed and divided by the outcome of the World Wars, dismembered. It was chiefly the Protestant section of Germany and Northern Germany, which was betrayed in the Soviet zone, subjected to communist oppression for 45 years, behind the Iron Curtain. Millions of Germans were forcibly displaced by the westward movement of Poland's boundary at the end of the Second World War. Most of these displaced people were Protestants. Many expelled. Millions upon millions of Germans lost their homes at the end of the First and the Second World War. At the end of the First World War, Germany, by March 1918, when they signed the peace treaty with Russia, had liberated all of Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, 
Poland, Ukraine, and even Georgia, Armenia, and the Caucasian Mountains. And in the German treaty with the Russians, notice they sat around the same table, unlike Versailles, where you weren't allowed to have any of the central powers. The Russians and the Germans sat together and they drew a boundary, which asked nothing for Germany, but which obtained independence for Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Ukraine, and Armenia, and Georgia, all of which the Allies forced Germany to hand back uh, to the Russians and give to the Reds after the Versailles Treaty. Here you can see the different languages in which the brest litovsk March 1918 Treaty was signed. It actually, if you look at the map of Europe today, you can see the German Treaty of brest litovsk March 1918 was more just and more accurate because this is what, after a century of chaos, Europe's gone back to. Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia has got the independence and Ukraine has got the independence and Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan. So isn't it interesting that their peace treaty was more fair in terms of demographic realities? Germany was fighting Western Front, Eastern Front, Southern Front. In fact, they're fighting all over the place. It was a pretty, pretty big stretch. 11th of the 11th, 1918, they agreed on an armistice on the basis of the 14 points promised by and guaranteed by American President Woodrow Wilson, which included no assigning of blame, no reparations, no assigning of territory except the self-determination of populations controlled and so on and so forth. Every one of those promises, 14 points, were violated in Versailles. The British Propaganda Office achieved its final victory after the war was over. We've got Lloyd George of Britain, Woodrow Wilson of the United States, and George's Clemenceau of France, three all-ignorant, all-powerful men, carving continents with um, just a child to lead them is the way that Lord Belfort described it. Those three all-powerful, all-ignorant men carving continents with only a child to lead them. Not that Lord Belfort was a particularly good man, but that's just his observation. The Versailles Treaty, signed in 1919, sought to pin all war guilt exclusively on Germany, the one country that actually tried to avoid it, the last country to mobilize. This made possible extortion of ruinous reparations, which brought about the economic and political collapse of Germany where billions of marks couldn't buy a loaf of bread, where you could use it for wallpaper. Because all the gold was stolen, the bankers turfed out millions of German war widows and orphans out of their homes and estates, had them on the streets, where German war widows were forced into brothels and cabaret shows owned in 800 of these sexually oriented businesses in Berlin run by Jewish communists who abused them, and you can imagine why there was such resentment and why they wanted to take back what had been stolen from them. This is at the beginning of the war. All of these German colonies were seized. Every German personal property, whether it was a farm or a home, it was all forfeit. Germans in Southwest Africa lost their homes and their farms, East Africa, Cameroon, all over and uh, all the German islands north of the equator and the Pacific became Japanese, which Americans would have to fight for in the Second World War. And uh, others were taken over by New Zealand and Australia and south of the equator. Germany after Versailles had chunks of the territory stolen all over the place, given to Poland, given to Denmark, given to Belgium, given to France, and so on. And so... If you want to know why there was a Second World War, you've got to read the Versailles Treaty. Until you understand Versailles, you don't understand how it was just one war. It was actually wicked, wicked rape of a country, looting of a country, and what Germany suffered is small compared to what Austria suffered. The chopping up of Austria and Hungary is a whole other story, which we can get into another stage. But they chopped it all up in order to make Austria small, and to create all these other countries which later fell to communism, by the way. It led to the Great Depression. We could see a German soldier who's a war hero with his Medal for Battlefield Courage, who's an amputee, having to beg on the streets to survive. Made the Second World War absolutely inevitable. Germany was limited to 100,000 soldiers, while Belgium had over half a million, and France had huge amounts, and even Czechoslovakia had far more. They had an army of a million. 
Marshal Ferdinand Fock, who wasn't exactly a good man either, but he said, this isn't peace, it's just an armistice for 20 years. That's effects in Germany and Austria. What about the effects in Britain? The involvement of predominantly Protestant Britain in the two world wars had disastrous repercussions on Christianity in that realm. Throughout the 19th century, Britain had been the greatest source of missionaries worldwide, the greatest finance of missionaries worldwide. In both Germany and Great Britain, the number of Protestant church members plummeted. Here you can see the percentage of evangelicals in Europe in the year 2000. And you can see it's pretty slim. Europe has gone from being predominantly Protestant and, and Northwestern Europe being Protestant predominantly evangelical to situation where most are non-religious. Missionary involvement declined dramatically. Both countries, Germany and Britain, suffered shocking secularization. So who benefited from the First World War? The banksters. Many bankers and industrialists amassed stupendous wealth at the expense of the combatants who incurred staggering debts. Those who control the debt control everything. In fact, as Mrs. Rothschild said, if my sons did not want war, there would be none. And sure enough, all wars are bankers' wars, say people, economists like Stephen Goodson. And these are some of the Rothschilds and Rockefeller. Communism, of course, benefited the most from the First World War. Lenin took the opportunity, seized, subjugated all of Russia and entire most of Eastern Europe. The communist enslavement of Russia is the biggest result of the First World War. The most significant political consequence of the First World War was the revolution that transformed Christian Russia into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, which chewed up over 50 million of its citizens in over 1,200 concentration camps of the Gulag Archipelago, barbed wire Arctic hellholes in Siberia, where they had them using hand power to dig entire canals, using nothing more than wheelbarrows and shovels, women being forced to work like slaves under Stalin. They murdered another 66 million people, including the Tsar and all his family, including his daughters and his son. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the greatest Russian author of the 20th century, spent years in communist hellhole in the Gulag archipelago and gave us the name Gulag to describe it. Not that it's exactly a set workbook in the West, but it is a required textbook under Putin's Russia. 49,000 churches were confiscated or destroyed by the communists in Russia in under 20 years. Over 100,000 farms were destroyed. 11 million farmers starved to death as a result of the decoolicization policies. All this from the Bolsheviks who took the advantage of an empire worn out by the war, which had dragged out for so many more years. If Russia had gone into the war and Britain hadn't been involved, they would have been beaten early on, empire would have survived, Serbia might have fallen, so what? That's it. The Russian empire would have been strong, but because they dragged out the war by Britain's involvement and America's involvement, for four years they were able to bring down the whole Russian empire. It wouldn't have come down if it just had a short war and a short defeat. It had suffered a defeat against Japan in 1905. It hadn't changed anything. Uh, but uh, this was not a defeat. This was a catastrophe. This is a revolution. And you can see the fighting. This is in Germany here. Revolutions to try and take over Bavaria and Berlin with revolutions. The whole of Europe could have fallen to communism back at that stage even. You can see the growth of communism, the burning of the farms, murder of the people, massacres, decolocalization, Kiev. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, you must understand the leading Bolsheviks who took over Russia were not Russians. They hated Russians. They hated Christians. Driven by ethnic hatred, they tortured and slaughtered millions of Russians without a shred of human remorse. More of my countrymen suffered horrific crimes at their bloodshed hands than any people or nation ever suffered in the entirety of human history. I think that's true. No people have suffered as much as the Russians have suffered under communism. It cannot be overstated. Bolshevism committed the greatest human slaughter of all time. The fact that most of the world is ignorant and uncaring about this enormous crime is proof that the global media is in the hands of its perpetrators. Meaning communist synagogue of Satan's. And here he documents just some of the people. Do you know that Leonid Trotsky was an American 
from New York, Leon Bronstein, who came over to join the revolution. He's the one who did most of the massacres of the people. He's an American New York Jew who came over to help them in Russia. In fact, a lot of the early Bolsheviks were Americans from New York who came over to help massacre the people. So they weren't even Russian Jews. They were American Jews in many cases who did most of the massacring. That's why Solzhenitsyn said these weren't Russians. To call it the Russian Revolution is an insult. Don't call it the Russian Revolution when Russians were the victims. We weren't the perpetrators. Alexander Solzhenitsyn declared the world has never before known a godlessness as organized, militarized, and tenaciously malevolent as that preached by Marxism. Within the philosophical system of Marx and Lenin, and at the heart of their philosophy, psychology, hatred of God is the principal driving force, more fundamental in all their political and economic potentials. He's saying Marxism is not economics, it's not politics, it's hatred of God at its very heart. Militant atheism is not merely incidental or marginal to communist policy. It's not a side effect. It's the central pivot. This is Bela Kun in Hungary. He took over and killed a few hundred thousand Hungarians in 1920 before he was ousted in a Bolshevik revolution in Hungary. Explains why Hungary was on Germany's side in the Second World War. Bolsheviks try and take over Berlin. Bolsheviks try and take over in Bavaria. Civil war in the streets. This is in Berlin, fight against Bolsheviks. It could have so easily gone that Germany could have gone totally communist back in 1918, 1919, 1920, easily. As Stalin said, it's not who votes that counts. It's who counts the votes. I think that's the IEC's kind of slogan over here too. Here you'll see there were no communist countries before 1917. Then during the Second World War, suddenly there was a huge jump because of the Yalta Agreement, and they reached the pinnacle in 1988, and then they start to lose ground. And the Berlin Wall coming down in 1989, vast amounts of countries were freed. We plateaued at a small number of communist countries, but includes the biggest nation in the world, China. So 1900, the people, only one place in the world could be said to have a majority of non-religious people. Uruguay is it. 1950, a third the world. Year 2000, it's including places like Austria and New Zealand. 2050, could get worse. And so you can see the growth of Christians in Europe to a almost 100% population. And after 1917, you can see it starts to take a steep decline. And these are other figures from Patrick Johnson. 1900, you can see how many evangelicals there were in Northwestern Europe. 2000, most are gone. And so in many cases, what you're seeing is, you can see from some of the cemeteries, this is in Russia, Christian cemeteries. But not now. In the wake of the First World War, many came to speak of a post-Christian era. Wars and revolutions threw the entire world into disorder, and pessimists and critics predicted the imminent disappearance of Christianity. And this is where the late great planet Earth came from, and Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, and Jesus coming soon, it doesn't matter, and these are last days, so why rearrange deck chairs in the Titanic? Why put up wallpaper in a burning building? Uh, you know, basically withdraw, defeat and retreat. Yet against all odds, despite having been dealt what seemed like a death blow in its heartland, Protestant Christians have still shown remarkable vitality. Now all these things became my examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as some of them were. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they're written for our admonition. As God's covenant people had overcome the Roman Empire, and the barbarian and Viking invasions, and the Arab invasions and onslaught of the Mongol Empire, and the bubonic plague, and the invasion of the Turks, and the upheavals of the French Revolution, Christians have adapted and overcome. Christianity has experienced dynamic growth in Africa, the Americas, and Asia. Even in Eastern Europe, in some of the most unexpected places behind the Iron Curtain, churches multiplied, faith deepened, despite the most relentless anti-Christian persecution by communist governments. The Berlin Wall came down. Communist idols were toppled. Christianity is resurgent in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine, 
in Russia, the rebuilt Church of Christ the Savior, restored a Russian president who attends church and is printing Bibles by the millions and appointing chaplains in the armies. You can see Russia's experience a resurgence of Christian freedom and culture. Jesus taught, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It is essential that we learn the truths of history to recognize the lies of propaganda. We need to study the word of God so that we can be freed from deception. If our ancestors who had fought in the First and Second World War could have seen what had become of their countries, they wouldn't have fought against each other. They would have fought side by side against the real enemy. Next time we fight side by side. So, any questions or comments? I was just saying, maybe in Europe they, they changed because they, they were sick, they were uh, depressed. Maybe they, or some of them blamed everything to God after the war. I guess like when so many children are often their mothers are not there, their fathers have died, they would blame everything to God. And to God. Yes, exactly. Yes. Not only that, but many people lost faith in the church because the church in many cases had encouraged them to go. Orthodox priests were, and Catholics were sprinkling holy water on the cannon as it was going out and telling them there's the, God's on your side and this is God's will and God's war and you're on crusades. And so, I don't know if you've seen the film uh, Joy X Noel, The Christmas Truce. Here they come out, they start hearing, what the singing? Christmas carols on the other side and they join in, they're singing Silent Night and they come out and next thing the Scottish soldiers see, God with us, Gott mit uns on the German buckles. We didn't know you believed in God. And, and both sides were amazed. We know the same carols. And next thing, having worship service together. And after a while, they were wondering, why are we fighting one another? When they got to know how they were Christians. My dad, even in the Second World War, he said he had more respect for the Africa Corps on the other side than for his own officers and politicians back home who had put them there. He said they were going through the same, they were to face the same heat dust, thirst, everything we were going through, he said we felt far more sympathy for our enemies than we did for the politicians back home who had shipped us out here. And uh, I mean, my father was just one who fought all six years Second World War. He said, we were on the wrong side. And I've spoken to many people who said this. It's just shocking. So, so I asked my father and mother why they weren't Christians when I got converted. And they said, what we experienced in the Second World War showed us there can't be a God. Now, my parents did get converted later, but they were so shattered by what they'd experienced and seen in Second World War, their confidence in the church was shattered because the church had encouraged the wars, just for starters, in most cases. And uh, so it took a long time for my parents to get over the fact that they, they just didn't believe it was possible that there could be a God when it seemed so much evil. Yeah, I mean, but you can see Satan's plan destroying Christianity in its heartland. Afterwards, it's not just the people killed, it's the people lost all hope. They lost all sense of justice or any sense of right and wrong. And of course, Hollywood has done so much damage by glamorizing these wars, which are not to be glamorized. Some people, well, we can honor brave, courageous men, people of integrity who did their duty, but that doesn't mean we should give the politicians a free pass who engineered all this. And they didn't have to keep going when there could have been peace talks. There's a lot of opportunities for peace. But no, they had to just keep pushing on and on and on. They wanted this, what do they call it? Um, unconditional surrender, which means the other side's going to fight to the very end because if you're not going to offer peace terms, then the war's going to carry on and millions more will die before you can come to an arrangement. You know, Do you want to fight to the death or do you want to make a reasonable negotiation and they wouldn't allow it well some wanted but uh, the allied side would not consider negotiations so we've dealt with some of these things before any other comments so you spoke about the king edward yes yeah. edward the seventh uh, wicked 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 reprobate playboy king as they called him he openly openly traveled with his mistress and he was married to a princess of Denmark and he would shame his wife by traveling openly with his uh, 
mistress. He was having an aff- he had so many affairs. He's a wicked, wicked man. And he, he did this openly because he wanted to bring the name of Queen Victoria and his father into disrepute. He despised them because they were hardworking, diligent. And he was, well, for example, he would complain that his father would force him to get out of bed when the sun had risen and things like this. Well, he still had a headache from his hangover or whatever. You know, he's, he's just a reprobate. In fact, Queen Victoria blamed her eldest son, Albert, who called himself Edward, for the early death of her husband. You know, she is mourning the rest of her life, wore only black thereafter. Her husband died, I think, and they'd been married, what, 20-something years? So um, he, he died in his 40s, early 40s. And she said it was this reprobate's eldest son that drove her husband to an early grave. And I guess there's no coincidence why the British royal family is one of the only royal families that survived the Second World War. Well, it makes you wonder because, first of all, do you know that Tsar Nicholas, when he was when he abdicated, the Duma arranged for him to be exiled to go to Britain, and Britain would not allow him. 19, he could have survived his whole family. They wouldn't take his family, his wife, his children, nobody. Why would they not do it? And they were said at the time, uh, we're fighting for democracy. We can't be seen to support a tyrant. Well, they were happy to be allied to him when he is in power. But the moment he's out of power, they wouldn't let him. He, he and his entire family could have come into exile to Britain. Why not? Britain had a big empire. They could have lived in Canada, for that matter. They wanted snow. Uh, so what, why? But the, you know that Kaiser Willem II was the oldest grandson of Queen Victoria. Kaiser Willem II was the favorite grandson. Queen Victoria died in Kaiser Willem's arms. Kaiser Willem was the first cousin to Tsar Nicholas and to uh, uh, King George V. So the kings of England, Germany, and Russia were first cousins, all grandsons of Queen Victoria. And King George would not allow his cousin, his first cousin, Tsar Nicholas and his family, to come to Britain for exile when they abdicated. His family would not have been murdered by the Bolsheviks if they'd been given uh, sanctuary, uh, I mean, Britain's willing to allow Muslim jihadists uh, have, to have citizenship in Britain, and put them on welfare. They wouldn't let the royal family of, of Russia go there. One of the s- saddest and uh, most disgraceful uh, things in, in the... F- and to think the British royal family were party to that. Of course, you can't blame the existing people, but, but King George V, that's shameful. Why did the king hate his parents? Is there any reason why... They were evangelicals. They were hardworking. They had a work ethic. His dad, Prince Albert, had a phenomenal work ethic. He was a, and he put up that whole crystal cathedral, uh, crystal path, what are they called? The, um, the, uh, crystal cathedral, I think they're called, that for the first of the, um, great, uh, exhibitions and so on. He was, uh, so hard working charities and all sorts of things. He was a real Lutheran evangelical. Uh, in fact, they say that the, popularity of Christmas trees and British tradition came from Prince Albert, brought it from Germany and things. Christmas cards also came from from Germany, from Prince Albert. Uh, So uh, now there he's got the son who's lazy, doesn't want to work hard and who isn't a Christian and his father's regularly berating him, you know, how can he still be in bed, the sun's risen and uh, get out and there's work to do and he just wanted to party and get drunk. He's a worthless piece of rubbish absolute evil, evil man. Now, the interesting thing is that while he was pretty worthless, his son uh, was a very hardworking who, who who wanted to take things back to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert's uh, stand. So, although he was bad, interestingly enough, his son was pretty good, but maybe that's because the mother rather than the father. I think he is married to, was it Queen Alexandria? Uh, she is Anyway, she is a Dutch, uh, I mean a Danish, a Danish princess from the Danish royal family. But actually, all the royal families in Europe were German, British, basically. Uh, they, in fact, I think 
I've got of just about every head of state. You can see they're all either a grandson of Queen Victoria or they're married to a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Uh, everyone from Portugal, Spain, Greece, all the way through to Russia, though. Norway, Denmark, they were all related to Queen Victoria one way or the other, either by marriage or, or by blood. And so that's one of the big tragedies about the First World War is that it was the end of the royal families of Europe. And the royal families of Europe are better than what we've got now because they had, they had a commitment to their countries without party politics. They weren't involved in party politics. There were parliaments, there was, there was elections, but the king was the executive or the queen. And this, this provides a, a check and balance, some kind of um, stability. You look in Africa, probably the most stable country in Africa today is Swaziland. And they've got a king, they've got a parliament, and they've got uh, the queen mother, and they've got a council of elders. That's a bit of check. That's better than Mozambique and all the other places. Ethiopia used to be more stable when they had Emperor Haile Selassie, but of course the communists killed him. I think uh, Africa could do a lot worse than having constitutional monarchies. For Europe, it would be better, better too. I, I trust the Zulu king more than I trust the South African president. You're likely to get more more justice from, from a, a king who has no party politics, he's not worrying about elections, uh, and he's, he's got a sense of duty because he's thinking about his children as grandchildren's heritage. Whereas a politician like de Klerk, he might sell out the whole country because he doesn't care. He can move overseas and he's got a big bank balance in Switzerland and a, a villa in France. You know. And that's often the mentality. Or Mobutu Sesaseku sold out the whole of Congo because he didn't care. He made himself rich and everyone else suffered. So, any other comments? What interest do you better when you said that the Baxter and Church in general? So, I mean, how do we now empower and equip the church to not continue the increase of Christians? Well, there is no doubt that it has a huge impact. Um, our spiritual life, if the church is salt and light in the community, if we fail to be salt, then things are going to degenerate and become corrupt. If we fail to be light, there's going to be an increase in darkness. So if the church fails to evangelize and disciple, and if our stands are low, for example, just take how in society they often say, no talking about politics or religion. Well, those are the two most important subjects of all which affect everything. Now you've got generations of people not allowed to talk about politics or religion in all these areas. Well, no wonder they, no wonder society's gotten worse because people are so stupid. Many people don't even understand how to talk about politics and religion. They can't discuss it. They don't understand it. And, but they can tell you about the different types of beers and they can tell you about sports stars and some scandals of some Hollywood person. But they know nothing about what really matters for now or eternity. And that's part of the problem. And many of our churches are so scared to touch politics or repentance and the law of God that many churches are now entertainment areas where it's a bit of a social club. So the church has had very little influence study. Just take, for example... We in South Africa are meant to be 76% Christian. Then how is it that only about 200,000 South Africans voted for pro-life, pro-family parties in the last election? That's less people than you can get at an Angus Buck and Mighty Men conference. What are they voting? Are they all voting for pro-abortion, gay marriage, perversion and all the other sort of things? Yes, apparently so. So most Christians in South Africa waste their votes on pagan secular humanist parties. And most Christians in South Africa send their children to pagan schools to be indoctrinated by the state in secular humanism and taught how to be a whoremongering, fornicating pervert. Are actual Christians doing this? Yes, no, there, there, there are quite a few. Um, we've got in South Africa, I think Taryn was giving the statistic, is it 2,000 Christian independent schools in the country? At least 2,000 Christian schools. And we've got something like 100,000 children being homeschooled around the country, including my youngest. Yes, all four of my children we've homeschooled. So, uh, yes, in fact, most of the books in the bookshop here are for homeschooling. Uh, 
about 85% of our book sales would be homeschooling textbooks. So homeschooling is growing. There's ACE, amongst others. That's the biggest. In Cape Town, there are a few accelerate Christian education. Uh, but in addition to that, there's Theocentric Christian education, TEC, which is very good. Very good. That's a very high stand. Uh, then I know a bunch of schools. Now, I'm afraid when I talk about independent Christian schools, and I think there's at least 2,500 independent Christian schools in South Africa. A lot of them wouldn't be that independent or that Christian because many of them are still using the government textbooks. But they have hymns singing. They sing, shine, Jesus, shine. They start with prayer. Yeah, but the textbooks still teaching them evolution and situation ethics. So, so while... So sometimes statistics can give a misleadingly good impression. Because if I say there's 2,500 Christian schools in a country, that's by the broadest definition. It doesn't mean the textbooks are all Christian. Some are. Some are not. Some have great teachers, but the textbooks are still terrible. Uh, some have good textbooks, but maybe the teachers aren't that good. But there are alternatives, and basically government schools are a disaster. Absolute disaster. By their own statistics, 80% of government schools are dysfunctional. That's what Ministry of Education says. I think they're being generous. I think it's worse. <laughs>